Hey, I'm Pastor Justin. And before we jump into worship, I wanted to give a special shout out to those of you joining us here online, especially if you're new to the online worship experience. And if that's you, here's a couple quick tips to take full advantage and engage. First, act just like you would for a regular service. Stand for worship, clap your hands, take notes during the sermon. All of the regular ways you'd engage at a worship service. Do them wherever it's possible. Second, ditch distractions, silence your phone, whatever can keep you dialed into all God is gonna do. And lastly, church is about pursuing God with one another. And it's the same here online. So throw this link to a friend as an invite and be sure to join us in the chat where hosts are ready to pray for you at any time and all of us are ready to worship together. So let's do just that starting right now. Praising and worshiping our risen savior, Jesus Christ. City Life, we invite you to stand to your feet as we enter into worship. We know that this month of December, we are celebrating the birth, the life of Jesus. And so we're gonna celebrate right now by the life that he has also given to us. So we're gonna put it together right here. Come on, clap your hands. Come on, right here. When I think of your goodness and your love, being kindness, and I know your grace is giving me life, it's giving me life. When I see your favor over me, I'm grateful. And I know my Savior is giving me life, it's giving me life. And your love, being kindness, and I know your grace is giving me life, it's giving me life. When I see your favor over me, I'm grateful, and I know my Savior is giving me life, it's giving me life, it's giving me That you're for me and I can see new mercies waiting for me every morning giving me life giving me life, life. i 
So say hello to a new friend and meet uh, and say hello to an old friend and we'll be back with worship in a few moments. church. You may go ahead and be seated as you're seated. We just want to say welcome to church tonight. We're so glad you're here with us. It's a great night to be at church. And so we hope whether you're a City Life Church family or you're a guest tonight, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad you're here. If you are a guest, just a special shout out to you. We would love to get to say hello to you. If you're joining us online, thank you for doing that. We would love for you to hit that connect button, jump into that chat, let us know you're here. If you're here in person, you can grab us. We'll hopefully grab you. We also would encourage you online or in person to text to that number on the screen, keyword guest, and that will start a conversation conversation with us. And you can give us info that you feel comfortable passing on. We'll reach out to you. But we do not take it lightly that you've taken time out of your busy life and um, in this meaningful month of December with so much going on to worship with us. And so we're excited that you're here. We hope you grab some communion elements. We will be having communion as part of our service tonight. So if you didn't, you can find them at either of our entrances. If you're online, just a reminder to grab something wherever you are so you can participate with us tonight. And then church, as always, we just wanna say thank you for your faithfulness and generosity and stewardship and giving here at City Life. It's just been a banner year and God has continued to be faithful. And so we are so grateful. And on the first Saturday of every month, we have started something new this year. We take 10% of the money that comes in tonight and we give that as a gift to another church locally, another ministry. And so we may have made a list and every month it's been so exciting to be able to cut those checks. And, um, and, and, and we, you know, Fred and I often feel those phone calls from those pastors or those churches, those ministries that are just like, what is this. Thank you guys so much. They're so blown away and they're able to invest that in the kingdom of God. How many know that's part of being a generous church, right? We serve a generous God who loves us generously. So we just want to remind you that that happens the first Saturday of every month. So tonight as we give to the Lord, that will be a part of how we as a church are giving back into what God's doing here locally in the 757. And you can give online anytime. If you're online, you can uh, uh, grab that give button. And then if you're here in person, we do uh, take physical gifts at either of our entrances and again online anytime. So thank you for that. We hope that you have an expectation to hear from God tonight. We know how God has things to say to each one of us. And so we're glad you're here with us. And um, just, just 
just press in or, or lean in to the fact that God loves you, He sees you, He knows you, and He wants to interact with each one of us tonight in a way that's fresh and new and life-giving. And so I know I have an expectation for my own heart, and I just want to encourage each one of us to have that. So it's a good night to be at church. Welcome to City Life. Our dream is that there will be no other place on this planet where Jesus is easier to find than the 757. So if you are in person or watching online and feel far from God, our prayer is that you find Jesus here tonight. Be sure to check out our events promo page on our website for all that's happening in the life of our church. Merry Christmas, City Life. As we enter into this holiday season, we want to invite each of you to join us for a Riverside Christmas. Happening on Saturday evening, December 23rd at 5 p.m., this is a specially designed service for you to invite friends, neighbors, coworkers, and family to attend with you. It will be a festive, one-hour, family-friendly service experience with a hot cocoa bar and Christmas cookie reception following. If you call City Life home, we would encourage you to pick up these invitation cards at either of our info centers so that you can hand them out as you go through this holiday season. In the spirit of giving, we will be collecting food donations for a local food bank as we come together that evening as well. We hope that you and your family will make plans to join us on December 23rd for a Riverside Christmas. City Life, for two full years now, we've been walking in this vision of making Jesus easy to find here in the 757. Not only did we start doing monthly projects to make an impact with our Matthew 25 moments, but we started shifting our Saturday gatherings on fifth Saturdays to service projects here in our city. And we're back at it this December, dedicating our gathering on the 30th to making Jesus easy to find here in the 757, mobilizing for impact beyond just 311 Selden Road. And our gathering on the morning of the 30th will happen in two locations. Our first gathering is for another building workday at the Aqueduct Boys and Girls Club from 10 to 12, tackling more projects to bless the staff and bless the kids there. And secondly, we'll continue getting word out about City Life Helps, handing out flyers in the Riverside neighborhood to let people with needs know that a helping hand from City Life is a call or an email away. So no matter where you choose to show up, let's do just that and show up. And afterwards, we'll show up in the church cafe for lunch together as we refuel and fellowship. And then we'll close out 2023 with a special online service at 5 p.m. that you won't want to miss. But just because we aren't in the sanctuary, this isn't a weekend to check out. It's a weekend to show up in a big way. So go to citylifeva.com slash fifth Saturday for more information and be sure to sign up. Let's continue to run with the vision God has given us, making Jesus easy to find with acts of service all over the community this December 30th. If you have any questions about our church, visit citylifeva.com or email us at info at citylifeva.com. Thanks for sharing your Saturday with us. Together, let's make Jesus easy to find. City Life, we invite you to stand to your feet. And as we enter into this holiday season, I'm reminded of the fact that the Lord is our hope. He is our light and salvation. And when we look into the world and see darkness and, and really difficult things, He is our hope. He is the everlasting God. We can put our trust in Him. We can put our trust in Him. And so we're going to sing these next few songs remembering that we can put our trust in the everlasting God.
trust in you. I will trust in you. Sing the Lord. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? of the Lord. Sing, the Lord is mine. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? And I will wait. of the Lord. Sing it again. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. He is our hope, our will. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the
this place. He is our everlasting God. We can put our trust in him. you God in heaven or on earth and church as we are in this month of December I was reading Isaiah 9 where it talks about the coming Messiah the birth of Jesus and it says that he is the Prince of Peace He is mighty counselor. He is eternal father. It says the government will rest on his shoulders. It 
and that's something we can put our hope in. The government will rest on his shoulders. It won't look like anything that we're familiar with on this earth, right? But he is the king of glory. He is worthy to be praised. So we thank you, Lord, that we can put our hope in you, that you are mighty counselor, prince of peace, eternal father, the king of glory, that there's no one like you on earth. There is no one like you on earth. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your life. So we worship you right here. We worship you right here. And now you are the King of glory. You deserve all of our praise, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty Counselor. Come on, let's give him our adoration right here and now. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? We can pray. just want to be with you. You're the King of glory. Fill this place. We just want to be with you. We just want to be with you. We will. 
had a chance to grab your communion elements you can do that right there in the sanctuary lobby and if you're watching with us if you're part of our online community you might want to just grab some juice and some bread just something that you can use to partake in this moment with us communions are an important part of our church on the first weekend of every month and it marks for us a tradition that Jesus started 2,000 years ago some of his final hours as he was having a meal with some of his closest friends. And he broke some bread and he passed a cup. And he did that to symbolize something that was about to happen, that his body was going to be broken for us, his blood was going to be shed for us, 
for the forgiveness of sin. And he he said to them, hey, do this in remembrance of me. And so for 2,000 years, this tradition passed down from generation to generation that we come together and we take this wafer and we drink this cup because we want to remember that because Jesus died for us, that our lives can be reconciled to God, that he paid the price that we deserve but could never pay for us. Grace through a substitutionary sacrifice. Now, now what's interesting as we look into the story of that first communion, that first Lord's Supper, the disciples, they had a promise, right? Jesus had told them already, hey, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be turned over to the authorities. My, my life is going to be forfeit. I'm going to be killed. But then on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. And, and even though they had that promise until his resurrection came, there was a, a season of grief and sorrow that they had to journey through. From, from Thursday night until Sunday morning, even though there was an expectation of a promise in some of them, there was sorrow that they still carried. And, and I'm talking about that tonight because we wanted to, moving into this Christmas season, We wanted to recognize that for some of you, even though you have the promise of celebration that's gonna come at Christmas, even though you have the hope of all the joy and the fun and the delight that's gonna come through family gatherings and, and being with your neighbors or maybe a workplace party, right? There still might be a veil of grief that you carry now because of sorrow that you're feeling. And so we wanted to, in this communion moment, to make room for you in your sorrow. I know for me, every year at Thanksgiving, my father passed away the week of Thanksgiving in 2014. And even though I know that Thanksgiving is going to be fun, it's going to be a celebration, we're going to be with family, as coming up to Thanksgiving, it, and now it happens every year, there's, there's some sorrow and some sadness that comes from the memory of his passing. So you might be coming into this Christmas season, and it might be that you have a loved one who's passed away, and this is your first Christmas without them. It could be that it's something that happened 20 years ago, but still there is that sense of sorrow that you carry. And and so as we go into this last worship song, we trust you're going to find your moment to partake of communion. It's your moment to thank Jesus for his death on your behalf. But there's going to be some of us down here at the front that are going to be here for prayer. And if you're in this room and you're saying, Fred, you're, you're talking about me. Right? There, there's some sorrow and some sad, there's some heaviness that I'm carrying. Grief comes to us in many ways, right? It could be the loss of a hope. It could be the, the, the loss of a dream. It could be a fractured relationship. There's so many ways that sorrow creeps into our life. And so we thought, why, why not, right? On this, this first Saturday of December, this first Saturday of December, create a moment where someone could pray with you. Maybe even somebody could give you an embrace. And so as we worship, if that's you, then come on then you come, you come. And then you're gonna find your moment in this worship song, in this set to partake of this communion and thank Jesus for the promise that he gave for you. Trust. 
Jesus. Father, I pray that in this moment that people would just find the sense of permission that you want them to have to feel the sorrow that is present in their life. To not just stuff it down deep into a box somewhere in their heart and hope that it never opens, but to find the courage that all of us have to find to open that box and to, and to hold that grief. Because what we know is, God, if that, if that grief and that sorrow doesn't have its moment of expression, it, it just builds deep inside. And so we pray that that moving into this Christmas season, if, if there's sorrow that people need to feel, well, they would find your permission in this moment to hold it, to let it come, to not be afraid, to lean into it. Because what we know, God, is that when we give ourselves permission to feel that grief, what we do is we open a door for your comfort. When, when we lean into that sorrow, what, what we know, God, is that, that we're actually leaning through that sorrow and we find you on the other side. So I pray that for every person that's here, every person that's watching online, every person that's listening at some point in the future, that they're going to lean into that sorrow and they're going to find the open arms of a God who sees them, who knows them, and can comfort them. Come on, in Jesus' name, and everybody said together, amen. Amen. So good. So good. Hey, just be sensitive. Can we just say that as we move through this Christmas season? If you're at a family gathering, an office party, hey, let's cheer for our kids. Come on. So good. Just you might, God might give you some sensitivity in your heart to recognize something about someone and just let's check on each other. Can we do that? Let's check on each other. A lot of people carry sorrow and grief, especially during the holiday seasons. So good. You know, we were, you see these paper, the paper up here. We were having a little technical, some technical difficulties with the monitor out back before the service. And, and, uh, and I was joking with somebody. It, re it reminded me of back in the days. If you were, you were in church in the 80s, you remember the overhead projector? Anybody remember the overhead projector? Right? There was no, we didn't have fancy projectors. In, in, right? There was a screen and there was an overhead projector right in the middle of the stage. And somebody had to put a, a, a transparency. Some, the younger generation is like, he's just, why, he, we have no idea what any of that is. Right? Transparencies that had the words to the songs. And you had to put the transparency on the overhead projector that would put it onto the, to the screen. And then if, the, if you were in a charismatic church, right, a Pentecostal church like ours, and, and, and the worship leader just had some liberty to pick whatever song they were going to do, that was a very important job with the overhead projector. Right? You knew the order of service which when, they, when they would get down and they would start thumbing through, thumbing through all the files that were on there. And so we, we, we had, a good, had a good laugh about that. But tech crew, come on, get the monitor up and warning. I know, come on, so good. Making it happen here at City Life. So let me ask you this question just to get our hearts moving in the right direction. When you hear me say the word peace, when you hear me say the word peace, what comes to mind? Somebody on the side. If I say peace, you think of what? Be with you. There you go. You finished the sentence. Yeah, that's good. Somebody else. Anybody else on this side? Be still. Oh, come on. That's good. Stillness. Calm. Yes, I like it. I like it. Jamal, ocean waves. Like, like when you're there at the ocean, just being there, just the, yeah, the, 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 yes, that dull roar of the ocean, the repetitiveness. I can feel it right now. Come on, Summer. Come on, Summer. Somebody else. Cleo, how about you? Do you have anything? Yes, a clean diaper. A clean diaper. <laughs> Snacks in the nursery. Yes. When you hear peace, what do you think of? Yes, peace and joy be with you. Yeah, somebody else? Anybody over here? Everybody's like, don't look at the teacher. Somebody? Peace? Rest. All good, darling. Peace on earth. Come on, you're setting me up for my verse. Very good. We didn't even have that planned. 
peace on earth. Let's look at Luke 2.14. We, we can't talk about the Christmas story and, and not think about the moments that the, the, the shepherds were in the fields watching their flocks, and it says that the heavens were open, and, 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 a, and, a, and a host of angels, right? This, this massive chorus of angels begin to sing this song that went like this, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now, part of that, I think, absolutely, is them proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. But I also believe part of it were the angels giving us some insight into what life could now be because of the Messiah. Meaning that there was a peace that we could have that Jesus was going to bring with him that he was going to impart to us the peace that we call shalom. Now, you might be familiar with this word shalom. You, you, even if you're unfamiliar with church or if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, you've probably seen that word or heard that word somewhere. And, and the word shalom, the word shalom comes from the Hebrew language, and it's the word, especially in the Old Testament, with, that translates peace. So when you get to your Bible and, and the word peace appears, in the original language, it was often shalom. Now, in the New Testament, that was written in Greek. You, you find the word peace. It's, it's typically going to be the word irene. But, but that was the Greek language trying to find a sense of articulating the word shalom that comes from Hebrew. This is, this is my belief when I think about what shalom is. Shalom's a big word. It's a big idea. It's a big concept. But the, but the part that we're going to focus in on for this sermon series is the part of shalom that is an attitude. It's the part of shalom that is a disposition. It's the part of shalom that I would say is a state of mind and heart. If I could say it this way, shalom is like the zip code for peace. You're either in it or you're not. Right? You think about your physical address. If you're, if you're a parent, right, at some point, you you're, 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 you're try to help your children to memorize their address. Right? That, that it speaks to where they live. I would argue that shalom is a place where our hearts can live. Right? It's a state of mind. It's a state of heart. It's a disposition. If the idea of shalom is new for you, then let me encourage you to check out the Bible Project. I love all kinds of things that the Bible Project does on YouTube. You can go there. They have all these great videos. A lot of them are great for kids, too. Just, just basic information about the Bible and biblical concepts that you can familiarize yourself with. They have one on just on the idea of shalom. Now, sometimes you have to be careful because sometimes modern-day theological publications, I would argue respectfully, attach shalom too much to a Western concept of material wealth. There's a group out. I'm a big fan of this group. It's called the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. They have an article called What is Shalom, what is shalom According to the Bible? And, and, and if you're interested in it, you can check it out. And these notes are always online. If, 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 if I'm giving these more than you faster, you can write them down. You can download them this week. What is Shalom according to the Bible? I like to throw out sometimes some references to resources that maybe are a little bit differently than what we believe because that's part of how you, you, you challenge what you believe. It's how you, 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 you check for blind spots that you might have. Let's not be afraid to read things that disagree with us. Can we say that? And, and so in this article, you're going to find, I think, that I, I appreciate their concept of human flourishing that they bring out, but I feel like they attach it a little bit too much to material things, where I would, I would argue that shalom is something that you can have in spite of material gain. That even in the midst of scarcity and poverty, shalom can still be your peace of mind. So here, here's my definition. Shalom is a deep sense of well-being and goodness. Who does not want that? Right? It is a deep sense, meaning that right, we all have times where we've felt good, but then all of a sudden something goes wrong in our day, and that feeling of goodness disappears, right? Like a morning mist. Right? There, there's a sense of well-being and goodness that is a surface-level emotion that is dependent and contingent on how well my day is going. It's dependent and contingent on maybe how the relationships are happening around me. But shalom is something deeper than that. 
Shalom is something deep inside of me that regardless of what's happening around me, there is a sense of well-being, there is a sense of goodness that is not easily displaced. It is a gift that God wants to give to you. It's a gift. And can I just say this too? What you believe about the source of the giver will build a belief in you about the gift that's to come. What you believe about God builds in you a belief about the gifts that he wants to give to you. I don't know about you, but I can think of some people in my life, throughout the story of my life, and I'm pretty sure I do not want to receive gifts from them. You with me? You have anybody? Is it just me? That you think to yourself, you know, I I don't know if I want that person giving me gifts because I'm not sure what's going to be in that box. right? Because what you believe about the source, what you believe about the giver, creates a context for your expectations about the gift that you're going to receive. Can we also agree that sometimes what we believe about God is not necessarily who he is? Can can we just agree that in this journey in life, one of the reasons why being in community is so important, one of the reasons why the study of Scripture is so important, is to constantly challenge what we believe about God, Because, and for many reasons, but one of them is because what you believe about him creates an expectation in you about what you're going to receive from him. I think it's one of the reasons why the Lord's Prayer starts the way that it does. Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The last part of that, hallowed be your name, is me saying to God that there is no one like you. The idea of him being in heaven is me saying to God that there is nothing that you cannot do. And the idea of him being my father says, and I matter to you. See, when you believe those three things about God, it begins to shape something in your mind. It begins to shape in you an unrelenting belief that God is good. When you believe in the goodness of God, then it creates an expectation about every gift that's going to come from him. It's why in the book of James it says, every good and perfect gift comes from our Father in heaven. I think the reason why the Holy Spirit inspired James to use the words good and perfect is because it's also describing the nature of God. And when we grasp the nature of God, we begin to grasp the nature of the gifts that he wants to give to us. I believe, I hope you do too, In the goodness of God, our Father, my Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. There is no one like you. There is nothing you can't do, and I matter to you. The goodness of God says to me that he always has my best interest at heart. When you walk through this life with a belief in the goodness of God, A belief in the goodness of God that translates into a belief that he always has your best interest at heart. Can I just just ask you to trust that it's possible that there is a gift of peace that he wants to give to you? And that peace and that gift, that deep sense of of well-being and goodness is attached in some way to what you believe about the one who wants to give you the gift. I believe... I believe that well-being and goodness deep in my heart is possible because the one who wants to give it to me is all of those things. See, this is important because if your shalom and your peace is not attached to the source, then it will be displaced by the circumstance. See, see, when, when, when your sense of peace is connected to who God is, then it doesn't matter what's happening around you. There can be a sense of well-being and goodness that you carry. If your sense of well-being and goodness is connected to how well your day is going, then there are going to be times where you're at peace, and then there's going to be times when you're not at peace. And I feel like when I read through the Scriptures, even in moments where, where Jesus is wrestling with the troubles of his day, it always seems to me there's just something inside of him that is steady. And what I would say is it's his shalom. There's a sense of well-being. There's a sense of goodness that Jesus carried all throughout his life. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to read in verse 23 to 27. This is a story that many of you might be familiar with. I believe this is history. 
I believe in the historicity of Scripture, but I also believe in, 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 in the prophetic nature of Scripture, meaning that a lot of what's happening in Scripture is also to teach us ab, ab, about a history, about the history of God revealing himself to man. But I also believe that there's prophetic imagery, meaning that the things that the Holy Spirit chose to inspire the writers of Scripture to include were supposed to be pictures of other things. I'm going to explain that in the story. Verse 23 says, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake. How many of you know there's all kinds of suddenlies that are waiting for us in this life? Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. Listen to what it says about Jesus. He knelt down in a frantic panic with a bucket, bailing the water out of the boat. How many of you know that's not what the Bible says? People are like, what is he reading from? Like, I don't know that translation. Yeah, me neither. Because that's not what it says. What does it say? It says, but Jesus was, what was Jesus doing? Yes. There's all kinds of biblical references to napping in the Bible, just so you know. We should add a 13th pathway called napping. Can we do that? Oh, I think we're on to something tonight, church. I like it. I like it. Listen, it says, the disciples went and woke him up shouting. They didn't say, hey, Jesus, are you awake? Are you awake? No, 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 no. Shout. They're in a pan. They're in a full-on panic. Many of the men who were in this boat earned their living on the water. They were fishermen from the moment they were Old enough to walk even probably before them. Their fathers were fishermen. They, they grew up. So we know if they're afraid, it's serious. I said, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And Jesus responded, why are you afraid you have so little faith? Listen, Jesus was in the same storm. He was in the same boat. And he was in the same circumstance but there was a peace that he had inside of him. Listen to what it says. It says, then he got up, he rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. And the disciples were amazed. Who is this man? They asked that even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, we know that this story is in the Bible for many reasons, but I believe one of them is this, that it is supposed to be prophetic imagery, that there is a calmness that we can have on the inside, regardless of the storm that might be raging on the outside. That there is a peace, there is a shalom, there is a calm, there is a sense of well-being and goodness that we can carry on the inside, even if something tumultuous is happening, happening around us on the outside. I think one of the reasons why Jesus calmed the storm is that he was creating a prophetic picture of the calm that he can create in you. Right? He's creating a, he, he was creating a prophetic picture is that same calm that needed to happen on the sea sometimes needs to happen in you and me. And the storm might continue to rage out here, but there's a sense of well-being and goodness that we carry in our hearts that the Bible calls shalom, shalom. John 14, 27 is going to come up on the screen this, this message is in, in, entitled, His Peace and Our Promise. We, we call it our, our promise because Jesus makes a promise to you and to me. He, he doesn't just say, hey, shalom is possible. He doesn't just say, hey, it's out there and maybe you'll find it or maybe you won't. He doesn't say, hey, some are going to get it, but others aren't. Listen to what he said. He says, I am leaving you with a gift, a peace. Come on, shalom. Peace of mind and heart, right? A state of mind and heart. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. Meaning there's, there's no other source for this kind of peace. There's no other source for this kind of well-being and goodness. The peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. He does not promise us a trouble-free life. He doesn't promise us a storm-free life. In fact, he says just the opposite. He tells us that trouble's going to be waiting for us. Storms in life are going to be waiting for us. But yet he says, hey, there is a gift that I want to give to you. It's what he carried, 
And then he passes it on to us, the gift of shalom, a deep, deep sense of well-being and goodness. I don't know about you, but I want that gift in my life. This series is going to be, we're going to take this all the way through December and probably into January. This series is going to, is going to be about how this gift of shalom Jesus has promised to us is related to and connected with the four primary relationships that we have in this life. And until we are ready to accept the biblical concept of portion, we will never fully experience shalom. Now, I want to talk about that just for a moment, and then I'm going to pivot to something else, but I'm just kind of just letting you know where we're going to be headed in this series. The, the four primary relationships that every human being have. there's a slide that's going to pop up It's going to give us the first two. The, the, the first two is this. You have a relationship with God, but you also have a relationship with yourself. And, 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 and shalom is a part of all of these relationships. It's especially a part of these two, and it's a part of the next two that are going to come in just a minute. But, but there is a sense of shalom that you and I are supposed to have in our relationship with God. And, and, it, and until you are ready to be at peace with your portion in relationship to your relationship with God, then that sense of well-being and goodness is always going to be elusive to you. Pastor Justin's going to tackle that one. No, I'm going to go back to the other one, Eve. There you go. Thank you. you you've got to be willing to embrace his sovereignty. Right? The, the, the portion that is given to us in the human experience is, 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 is a portion of of being subject to the sovereignty of God, meaning that there are things in this life that we cannot control, that there are things in this life that no matter how hard we try, we can't change the outcome. And until we are ready to come to a place where we embrace his sovereignty, right, then that peace is always going to be elusive to us. You've got to be willing to embrace your unchangeables. You've got to be at peace with yourself. There are things in your life that also you cannot change. And many of those things are because of the sovereignty of God. And maybe that in and of itself is a source of consternation and frustration with you. Then this is going to be a good series with you. That There is a portion that is assigned to us in this life. There are things that are given to us by God that we cannot change. The unchangeables. All right, let's look at the next two. We have to be willing to be at peace with others and at peace with creation. We've got to be willing to embrace the diversity in the world. Can, can, we just, can we just say for a minute, if we keep trying to spend the rest of our lives trying to form people in our image, we are trying to undo something that God has already done. The whole concept of Imago Dei is that God created them in his image. And it's hard for us to accept sometimes that he wanted to reveal something of himself to the world through others that he didn't choose to reveal in us. And so in our relationship with other people, shalom is present. And shalom is being willing to embrace the difference in other people. We're going to do a whole week on that. And then this idea, oh, come on, Anna, you don't like the word chores. Yeah, we have chores. How many, you have chores. Being at peace with creation means that you accept the reality that God put you here to do some things, to be productive, to be a contributing member of society, but also a contributing member of the kingdom of God. That there are tasks that are assigned to you and that are assigned to me. Do we have some choice in tasks? I think we do. I think there's some multiple choice in this life. I think God sometimes gives us choices. We'll be talking about that in this series. But some things he assigns to us. It's non-negotiable. Again, if you've got kids some, right, or if you, right, you grew up in a house where there were chores, right? sometimes you had a choice, sometimes you did not have a choice. Remember on Saturday morning, I'm trying to sleep. My dad's always started the lawnmower outside of my bedroom window. He did. He's a wise man. That was him saying to me, you do not have a choice right now in whether or not you're going to sleep or whether or not you're going to help. There, there's, there's chores. There's work that has been assigned to you and to me. Embrace your chores. These four relationships, we're going to see how shalom is a part of them. And if you're not willing to embrace how shalom is part of them, then even if you believe in the goodness of God, even if you believe he has your best interest at heart, even if you embrace this belief and this idea that your shalom is not contingent on your circumstance, until you're willing to bring that shalom with you into these four relationships, that sense of peace and well-being will always be elusive to you. 
All right, now let's shift gears a little bit. Somebody say, the person before the peace. The person before the peace. See, see, you can't have Jesus' peace without first having Jesus. Let me say that again. You can't have Jesus' peace without first having Jesus. Jesus just doesn't want to give us gifts and then walk away. Right? Jesus doesn't just want to give things to us, but then not be in relationship with us. In fact, I would argue that everything that he wants us to have that comes from his hand begins first by being invited into a relationship with him in the first place. And that relationship with him is more important than anything that he would give us. But anything that he wants to give us is never going to be had until we first accept him. So we've been doing this welcome home moment every week in 2023. I've been praying about it. We're going to continue to do it in some way, I think, in the future of the church. Because talking about the gospel is important to us. And I hope it's important to you. We want every person who walks into these doors or logs in as part of our online community at some point in their life to have a sense of being welcomed home by heaven. It's not about being welcomed to this church. It's about you being able to look back into the story of your life and having a sense that there was a moment in time where you felt welcomed home by heaven. Because we believe that all of us in this life share the same deep abiding need, and that's to know God and to be known by him. It is a hunger and a thirst that is deep inside of you and me. And we will chase after things in this life until that hunger and that thirst is satisfied. And we might try to do everything that's possible and it will never quite be satiated because Jesus is the only one that can do it. You and I are born into this life separated from God. And our regrets, and all of us have them, they keep us separated from God. And it creates this great dilemma for us, right? Because here we are separated from him, but our great desire is to know him and to be known by him. And one day you and I are going to stand before God on a day of judgment and have to give an account for our lives. And for some people, it breaks our heart to know that that will be the very first time that they will ever have a sense of knowing God and being known by him. And we want to change that. We want people to know that you can know him now. You can know him today. There's a favorite verse of ours in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says, If anyone's in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Who doesn't want to be the new person that God created you to be? Who, who doesn't want to reach for the destiny that God put in you from the moment you took your very first breath? Jesus says to you and to me that there is a newness of life that comes when we devote our lives to him. And part of that newness of life is new desires. Part of that newness of life is to dream after and reach for new things. It might be that some of your regrets you're still wrestling with because you find yourself going and falling down these same traps. And Jesus says, I've got something that can fix that, and it's called a new heart. When we make a vow of devotion to Jesus, he begins to change us on the inside, giving us new desires, giving us new hopes, giving us new dreams, giving us a new way to live. And not only does he create newness of life for us here and now, he offers us forgiveness for every regret that we've ever had. And you know how it even gets it even better? Because we're still going to make mistakes. And he says, I'm willing to forgive those things too. When he died on the cross 2,000 years ago, grace was made possible through a substitutionary sacrifice. So that for every one of us, one day when this life comes to an end and we stand before God on that day of judgment, we don't have to be in fear of condemnation. We can step into that moment with a hope, a humble hope of an invitation by our creator to enter into eternity with him. We're telling that story every week because in hearing, people believe. And in believing, believing, they might make their own profession of faith in Christ. And we trust that if you're here tonight and as you look back over the story of your life, you can't find a moment in time where you've made a vow of devotion to Christ. You'll find it with us here tonight at the end of the service. People that make that vow of devotion to Christ in our modern-day contemporary culture are called Christians. 
We get this term as we look throughout Scripture. We find it used various times in the New Testament. There's Acts 11.26, and there's Acts 26.28, there's 1 Peter 4.16. And, and this idea of Christian comes from the, a part of Jesus' name. We refer to Jesus as Jesus Christ, but it's important that we understand that wasn't Jesus' last name. Right? When I introduce myself to people, I say, hey, I'm Fred Michaud. When Jesus introduced himself to people, he did not introduce himself as Jesus Christ. Right? He would have introduced himself as I'm Jesus son of Joseph from Nazareth. So if you were to transport me back 2,000 years ago, right, and if I were to introduce myself, if I were to do some time traveling, I would have to be culturally relevant. I would say, hey, my, my name is Fred, son of Paul, who grew up in Verina. And people are like, where is that? I know you cannot find it. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's a, a little bit of nowhere just outside of Richmond. right? But the idea was that your identity was connected to your father and then where you were from. How many of you know there's some prophetic imagery in that? I want my identity to be connected to my heavenly father. And not just where I'm from, but come on, where I'm headed, to a heavenly place. Christ is a title. We call him Jesus Christ because it is a title that means the anointed one. It's a, it's a modern way of saying that we recognize him to be the Messiah the Savior of the world. So, so when we identify as being a Christian, really what we're saying is that I am a devoted follower to a man by the name of Jesus who's not just a man but fully God and is the Messiah that God sent to the world to save us. He is the anointed one, the Savior of the world. See, the very first way that followers of Jesus were identified was not by calling them Christians. That, that came later. Many historians believe it was a, a, a title that was, that was coined in, in the city of Antioch, and it wasn't even one of honor at first. It was one that was demeaning. Another sermon for another time. But the early disciples, they were called followers of the way. Look at this verse that's going to pop up. It says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. And lots of historians believe that this, this concept of being followers of the way came from this talk that Jesus gave to his disciples as he was approaching his death. He referred to himself as the way, and so the early church picked up on that. Let's go to the next verse. It says in Acts 19, 1 through 2, and it says, Meanwhile, Saul, this is Paul the apostle, before his conversion when he was killing Christians. Right? Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Followers of the way. Listen to this quote from Relevant Magazine back in 2002. I love it. It says, being a follower of the way... It's not a path to travel, but rather a pattern to follow. Come on, that's good, isn't it? It's not a path to travel, but rather a pattern to follow. An example, if you will. In order to follow the way, we have to be like the way. We have to imitate the way. And we need to pay careful attention to the life of the way and let people see that in us. The early Christians were not called Christians because they were pious people who lived morally superior lives with a conding attitude toward their fellow man. Come on, let's just let that sink in for a minute. God forgive us. Listen to this. They were called Christians, which means Christ-like ones, because they imitated their leader. They lived lives of compassion, love, Humility, patience, and virtue. Come on, that's so good. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. As the band's coming, listen to this. Let me share this thought with you. First century people who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah were identified by names that placed a greater emphasis on becoming like Jesus and not just believing in Jesus. Come on. First century people 
who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah were identified by names that placed a greater emphasis on becoming like Jesus and not just believing in Jesus. You throw that definition up for me for Shalom one more time. A deep sense of well-being and goodness that is anchored in Jesus. See, I'm adding to the definition there for you a little bit. It's a deep sense of well-being and goodness that is anchored in Jesus. Now, I've been talking to you tonight about wanting to have this gift that Jesus gives to you. I've been talking to you tonight about wanting to have this sense of well-being and goodness that's deep inside of you, that's not connected to your circumstances or your situation, a deep sense of well-being and goodness that's not connected to your day, but it's connected to your Creator. Right? This idea of what you believe about God creates a belief in you about the gifts that He wants to give to you. So, I'm, I'm, so I've been talking about this idea of wanting to have this gift that he wants to give to you in the same way as you enter into this, this Christmas season. It might be that you're expecting a gift that someone's going to give to you and you can't wait to have it because of the enjoyment that it's going to bring to you. And I would just say there's nothing wrong with that. Can, can we just say that when God promises us gifts, part of it is because he wants to create an expectation of enjoyment inside of us. Part of it is because he is a perfect father. He does always have our best interests at heart. And he delights in showering us with things that are beyond this world. But can I just ask you to add something to that? Me meaning that our desire for shalom and our longing for peace can't just be about what's in it for us. Because the more we experience shalom, the more we bring that peace into our relationship with God and into our relationship with ourselves and into our relationship with others and into our relationship with creation, can I just say to you, the more our lives are going to point other people to Jesus. Part of the reason why we want to chase after shalom in this life is because this peace that he wants to give to us is supposed to be a cornerstone of our witness to the world. Something inside of us that maybe the world on the outside looking in would say, why aren't they troubled? Why, why aren't they stressed? Why, why aren't they anxious? Not that we're not going to experience those emotions in this life, because we are. But the question is, are those the things that are going to be fleeting? You with me? And is there the deep sense of well-being and goodness that is going to rise to the surface? And then, and then, we become something that Jesus talked about in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, that we have an opportunity to be a light to the world. So, Father, as we step into this moment of worship I pray for everybody in this room that has come in here feeling troubled. I pray for everybody that might be logged on tonight as part of our online community that logged in feeling troubled. Father, we pray that shalom would be within reach. That the gift of your peace would be within their grasp. That e even now, even now, at the sound of my voice, even now, as the music plays, they would have a sense of extending the hands of their heart, receiving from you a gift of peace that only you can give. In Jesus' name, come on, let's worship together. One thing I desire, only this I seek, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. This will be my posture, laying at your feet. Oh, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. Father, 
closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful, dearest father, my closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful, sing one thing I desire. One thing I desire, only this I seek. Oh, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. This will be my posture, laying at your feet. Oh, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. Father, closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful, dearest, dearest Father, closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful. Before I read you this verse to close out our, our time together tonight, I just I want to invite you again, if you're here, as you look back over the story of your life, if you can't find a moment in time where you've made a vow of devotion to Christ, we want to invite you to find that moment here with somebody that's going to be at the altar. Every week we're down here to pray with you. Or if you have something else that you want to pray for, if you didn't come in that moment of grief because you just felt a little conspicuous, that's okay. God's going to give you a second chance right here. If you're part of our online community, there's a button that you can push that will take you into a private chat room and one of our hosts would love to talk with you more about what it means to be a devoted follower of Christ or if you've got something that you need someone to pray for you about, then don't withhold that gift from you. Hit that button and let one of our hosts connect with you. Come on, this is Philippians 4. I know some of you have been waiting for this verse. Ever since you knew I was going to be talking about peace, you knew we were coming here. Philippians 4, 6. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything and tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Verse 7, here it comes. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Right? Another translation renders it the peace that passes all understanding. His peace, listen to what it says, will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we pray of all the gifts that people are going to receive or maybe not receive during this holiday season. For everything that we're going to celebrate or maybe even some disappointments are going to come. May it be that we would walk in the hope and the faith that there's a promise, there's a gift, there's a peace that you want to give to us that's called shalom. They can only come from the hands of heaven that passes all understanding in this earthly realm. 
And may it be that we would possess that gift for the rest of our days. And in doing so, come on, that our lives would continually, Jesus, to point others to you. And it's in your precious name that we pray. And everybody says together, amen. We'll see you next week. Wasn't that an awesome worship experience we just had? Now, I know that you're watching at home or another location, and this online church platform may be new to you. You may be distracted by dinner prep or noisy surroundings, but I challenge you not to log off just yet. If you need prayer, we have hosts ready to pray for you. You can simply click the prayer button and somebody will be able to pray with you in a private chat. And whether you decide to stay for prayer or not, we hope that this isn't the last time you join us. We hope to catch you in person or right here next week at citylifeva.com backslash livestream. See you again soon.